Hey everyone, my name is Chenny. And I'm Ramya. So we work on a technical consulting team at Google, and we get to see companies all around the world push the boundaries of the modern web. And while you might have heard some great sessions today talking about different modern web technologies, we are here to focus on the real-world challenges faced by e-commerce companies in implementing these technologies. So since we're talking about the real world, a real-world metaphor. Maintaining a website is a lot like maintaining a house. This right here is the house that I grew up in. It's probably not like the house that you grew up in, just like the website you work on is different from, the, say, the person over there. But some things are the same. You have maybe a place you sleep, maybe there's a dining room. When something breaks, like the AC, you might say, well, I can fix it. And your you know, friend might say, no, you should just call somebody. Right? Over time, when you moved in, when you moved to that new platform, it might look like there's room over here on the left. But technical debt, feature creep, because Black Friday and the holiday season is coming up, you're trying to get things in, and it gets kind of messy. And I think the house is a great metaphor, because like an e-commerce site these days, it's not just about landing in one place and you're done. It's about the journey. You're going from one room to room. You're going from a page to another page, from the home page to the search page to the checkout page. And if the room is like this, you get kind of confused. You don't want your user to feel confused and get lost in it. So it's time to remodel. Maybe you need to upgrade your foundations. Obviously, to remodel, we've talked about a lot of different things throughout today and other talks, things like that. And like all tools in the toolbox, things like Progress Web Apps, AMP, Google Sign-In, Google Pay, these are great tools. But just like I can't go to the store and buy a power drill that I saw a great commercial of and be like, I'm going to nail this remodel, I could very well destroy everything. So like all tools, just because they fit, they're, they're kind of like puzzle pieces, pieces. The two pieces fit, but you might not be actually making progress towards the big picture. So what's the big picture? So at Google, we like to say, focus on the user and all else follows. And so we really think that that full picture you're building towards, whatever you choose to do in the e-commerce journey, you need to improve user friction. Think about if you're trying to add service workers, if you're trying to try some of the cool new APIs and like WebXR and things like that, how is your solution actually improving the user's journey? Because there's no silver bullet here. To talk about this, I guess, Rama, you had an example? Of course. Satwa is a company that sells luxury mattresses, and they wanted to ensure that their users have a very smooth and fast online shopping experience. They decided to use AMP as a technology to enable that. In their first iteration of their product details pages, where they created the AMP version of that page, the user had actually to click from the AMP page to the product details page, and then click again to get to the cart page. They realized that this was not the best user experience. So in their second iteration, they changed the design such that the user can see the full details of the product within the AMP page and be able to click to add to cart and even see the cart from the same page. This resulted in reduction of friction for the user going from three taps to two all in the same page instead of three pages earlier. The results were astounding. Between the two iterations of AMP, they saw a 50% improvement in conversions. Thanks. So it's not just AMP. If you're creating things like a Progress Web App, you might run into this too. So here's an example from Expedia. Expedia has been working on a brand new front-end platform. It's four times faster on slow 3G, on lower-end devices. It's really great. Their CEO even recently said in the earnings call that speed benefits deliver conversion benefits. Usually, we'll say, we're going to stop here. Great case study. Instead, we're going to go into an interesting learning they had as part of this process. So Expedia, like many of the sites that you might work on, is a large e-commerce site. They're not just going to move from one old platform that's clearly working over to a new platform overnight. They need to do this in a piecemeal way, because maybe some teams you know, are on a new platform. They have to socialize it to other teams. And so in doing that, they actually learn an interesting lesson. Users value consistency. So some users, in, during the migration process, they land it on the old experience. And then after clicking around, you get put into the new experience that's faster. And they might move back and forth a couple of times. That population, to no surprise, actually probably did poorer than if you just stayed in one experience or another. It's very much like if I was up here and I was wearing one brown shoe and one black shoe, you probably couldn't take me quite as seriously as you're taking me right now. Hopefully, it's on the serious side. <laughs> so I think users value user journeys that are consistent. 
So make sure your solutions, not only in that page you're building, but in the entire journey and how you're measuring it, is actually reducing friction. Of course, what I'm saying, though, means that if your journey needs to be consistent all the way from, say, the entry point from the search results page to checkout, you're probably going to run into a lot of challenges. So when we work with a lot of e-commerce partners, we run into three main challenges. Number one is something that many of you probably think about, organizational alignment. Then you lead, get to a technical approach, and then finally, measurement. And so we'll talk about that today. Of course. Let's talk about the first challenge, organizational alignment. When I talk to people in e-commerce companies and ask them, do you think investing in performance projects to improve user experience will help improve your core business metrics? The answer is an immediate yes. However, when it comes time to prioritizing performance projects, there's always several hurdles, lack of time, lack of resources, you name it. One of the key ingredients that's missing here is organizational alignment. Performance is not just an engineering priority. Why? Consider this. Your content creation team wants to generate great content for the users to consume. However, they might create images that are too heavy or not optimized because they are not going through the image optimization layer. The marketing team spends several dollars to bring traffic to the site and care deeply about the user experience. However, they might also have tags that are either old or redundant or obsolete. The design team cares very much about that end-to-end -end experience, but they might have some really cool new features that do not use shared components. In each of these scenarios, one thing is clear, which is that performance needs to be a priority among every team that affects the website and cares about user experience. Let's look at two approaches, a top-down and a bottom-up approach, in order to create organizational alignment. And we'll do this using two examples of partners, 1-800-Flowers, which is a global flower brand, and then Just Fly, which is a Canadian travel agency. 1-800-Flowers believed that the modern marketing department is really marketing plus technology. This is a very sh big shift in mindset. And what they did was to break out of organizational silos and create a cross-functional team that comprised of product, marketing, design, development, and analytics. This was led by the CMO of the company, and they were given a very clear shared goal, which was to drive growth for the company by investing in emerging product experiences. This allowed this cross-functional team to work really closely to invest not just in one or two, but almost the entire spectrum of modern web technologies. And as you can see, this yielded some great results. Seeing a 50% uplift in conversions does not come easy. Let's look at the other example, Just Fly. Even if you don't have a top-down mandate, you can use data to kind of prove your case and get that consensus. Just Fly did just that. They started off with bite-sized proof of concepts and experiments and got that consensus amongst their management and cross-functional teams to invest in a progressive web app. They started off with this high-level goal of improving the booking experience on their site. And they used data and experiments for just about everything from testing different JS libraries to uh, testing different checkout flows and design. And also, they um, had the Add to Home screen icon be installed by a few users to see how those users behave differently from others. And with all of this data, they not only got the buy-in from product and marketing, but they also got the headcount they needed to build the PWA. And they merged the code bases of two of their brands so that they could launch both of them as a PWA in the same time frame that it would have taken for one. Now, that's efficiency. And as you can see, with a 35% improvement in bookings, this is a great result for them. All in all, whether you use a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach, it's important to keep in mind that organizational alignment is key to not just prioritizing your performance projects, but also to gain the right visibility so that everybody that cares about user experience also cares about your project. Well, once you get the organizational buy-in, you still have to build the project. So we're not here today to talk about all different ways to you know, build a great progressive web app or a modern web experience. 
we'll share a little bit of the successful traits we see of good projects we see out there. One big pattern is that we see success in having a long-term vision and then having achievable goals towards that vision. To give an example, so I was recently in Spain with my wife, and we visited La Sagrada Familia over in Barcelona. I think it's a great example of this. This has been under construction for five generations, and yet it still adheres to the original architect Gaudi's original vision. Despite that, even though it's still under construction to this day, it opens its doors to 2.5 million tourists a year. It's actually very much like some of the e-commerce sites that you have. On Black Friday, not only are people going to check out, you probably are running like 2.5 million A-B tests through some platform. So I think it's really interesting to think about that. A lot of teams have that long-term vision, and they often tell me that, we, yeah, we want to get that time to interactive to under five seconds. But oftentimes, you find yourself, we ran Lighthouse, and we're really far away from it. And what, turn, what happens is, well, we'll get there someday, and then there's no, nothing achievable to, to get there. It's just something you see off in the distance, in the horizon. Oftentimes, they come back and say, well, we're just going to have short-term goals. And this is great. They have sprints or everything to get quick wins. And not to say quick wins aren't bad, but oftentimes, you kind of get into this eternal cycle of, well, there's a deadline here, something we can achieve before the holiday season. And then that's all you do. You go into circles or you regress um, after it a little bit. It's really important that you have both a long-term vision, a short-term goal, and you make sure that they are actually related, that the short-term goals is making meaningful progress towards a long-term vision. Let's make this a little bit more concrete. We all like to say up on the stage with the other speakers that one of the visions is to improve speed. Obviously, what does that mean? There's a lot of different ways to measure. So let's go back to what I was saying earlier from a user perspective. Improving speed might be to focus on user navigations. Because when we say you want to optimize your cold page load, or maybe your return page load to see if you're using caching, or if you're comparing single page app to multi-page app, a lot of times we're talking about that ease, that latency between me clicking on the user interface and the response in your UI if something's showing up. So let's talk about speed in, in that regard. So go, to go back to the house really quickly, I think doors are a great kind of example of what navigation is. An e-commerce site, it's like a house. You move from room to room. You might come into the back door, the front door, or something like that. And throughout the process, to complete the journey in the house, like to complete the journey on your website, you move from room to room. On Thanksgiving, you're holding the hot turkey in the kitchen. Do you want to mess around with the, room, the door on the left here, where you have to find one key, and then grab another key to get through the door in the back? It's, it's probably not the door you want. Likewise, there are probably experiences in your e-commerce journey where you don't want the user during sorting filtering or searching to have to kind of pay the cost of that locked door. There might be a good place for you to have a door on the right here. I'm not saying that it's always client-side routing or anything like that, but there are different techniques of making that as seamless as possible. So we'll jump into three examples from Walmart, eBay, and Airbnb who are in different parts of this modern web journey and kind of dive into how, kind of how they're breaking down this process. Walmart's a great example, extremely leading e-commerce site, and they recently made a North Star goal to reduce time to interactive by 70% on low-end devices such as the iPhone 6S, Moto G4. And this is an extremely aggressive goal, to going back to what I was saying earlier. But, and I like that they were able to kind of make that goal. So they organized a bunch of product and engineering teams to kind of make meaningful progress towards that. And then in the last couple of months, you know, they got 25% of the way there with improvement on, on some pages. But just because you, you know, make good progress from 0 to 25% doesn't mean just making quick wins or the same process is going to take you from 25% to 70%. But that work is important, because in that work they did, they were able to show significant kind of business improvement and use that to kind of socialize it across their teams. But what do I mean by going from 25 to 75% might not be quite as simple? Take this, it's not really my kind of room, but let's say it is. I could organize this room by just taking some books out and reshuffling and making sure they're all in the same order. But if I was going to take that strategy and do that for everything in this room, I don't know if I'll make meaningful progress and finish in time. If I'm going to clean up this room, I might actually say, well, look, this is kind of how I would like one shelf to look like, but let's kind of take all the books away, move the shelves around to actually get a nice looking kind of place. Likewise, what Walmart is doing is that because they had a North Star goal and they made short-term progress, they're now able to start thinking about, well, what other larger shifts can we take to get to the goal we want to do? Is it building a progressive web app? Is it adding service workers in some meaningful way? I think we're really interested to see kind of what they're going to work on in the next year. Speaking of service workers, 
eBay is actually using one of the service workers' techniques to improve user navigation on their site. So in the, one of the earlier talks, we talked about kind of how you can use service workers to improve user navigations. There's lots of different ways. eBay is just using one potential way, and they're testing this right now. So they're doing predictive prefetching of listing pages. So for example, if right now, if I go to eBay and I say I'm looking for a camera for Christmas for my dad, and dad, you didn't hear that. I don't think you're tuning in. Um, so right now, if I see a camera in the search results, I have to wait until I click on the listing, and then the browser makes another HTML request, and I'm waiting for that as a user. And depending on what connection I'm in, you know, that could take a long time. Well, you basically, like, if we could predict with high accuracy what you're likely to click on, you're going to click on you know, this camera right here. What if we post message to the service worker that particular file you need, and then the service worker is pulling in the background while I'm considering which camera to click on, so that when I do click on it, well, it's already there on my phone. So that when I click through, it's as instantaneous of a, of a navigation as possible. Of course, what if you don't have the service worker architecture yet already in place? You're waiting on you know, Q3 for that to be done. Or maybe you know, some of the quick wins for initial page load might not be there, and you're kind of stuck there. Because you have a long-term vision of, of improving user navigation, and you might run into a wall at some point of the short-term goal, because you have that set up, you can start thinking about different ways of getting to that long-term vision. And this is kind of where Airbnb is kind of thinking about. So Airbnb is like, well, sometimes our page re rebooting that JavaScript application on every single page might be a cost we don't want every single page load to be. So they saw that, what if we can only update certain parts of the page, say, in the search results, so that only that refreshes, only that shows up when the user clicks on something. In doing this, they actually measured the user perceived speed of that load. And they saw that loading the search results page in that manner was a seven to eight time improvement. And so let's say they start diverting more user traffic to take advantage of client-side routing, so that now 88% of search results loads are leveraging the seven to eight times speed improvement. Because at the end of the day, it's a user's journey that matters. Hopefully, this is a quick example of how you can keep an eye on a long-term vision, whatever that may be, set short-term goals, and realize that there are a lot of different ways when you hit different walls in that, those short-term goals of getting to that long-term vision. Let's talk about the third challenge. Measurement. Let me ask you something. Please raise your hands if you've ever worked on a project with great potential to improve user experience, but the plug got pulled at some point because you couldn't prove the impact. Anyone? It's quite a few of us. And this is certainly not uncommon, right? Even if you have a great organizational alignment and a good technical approach to your project, if you don't have the right measurement strategy, it could still fail. Because of this, even though this is the third challenge we are covering here today, this is one of the first things that I've seen successful companies do in terms of thinking about their performance project. A good measurement strategy is one that is shared, automated, and actionable. What do I mean by that? It needs to have shared metrics. To to Cheney's earlier point, when you have the North Star goal, you need to have um, specific metrics that are mapped to that North Star goal that are also shared amongst people that care about that user experience. Having these shared metrics is really crucial, in a, and you have to define it in a way that people understand exactly what those metrics are and how they are calculated. The second piece here is automated tools. These tools are necessary not just to measure these metrics, but also monitor them over time so that you can gain real good insights from them. And once you have those tools, it's important to understand what are the actionable next steps. Now that I have this insight, what changes can I make in order to meet that North Star goal? Let's dive into shared metrics a little bit deeper, because it's often not as well understood. When I talk about mapping goals to specific metrics, um, we have these four big milestones when we talk about a user journey um, in terms of acquisition, engagement, conversion, and re-engagement. Let's focus more on the conversion piece. Let's say you really wanted a seamless checkout experience for your users. One way to measure that is to think about the average time that it takes for, let's say, 90% of your users to go from that card page to the order completion page. 
understanding from a user perspective how easy or difficult it is for them to convert when that intent is clear is a good way, potentially, for measuring um, whether you're having a seamless checkout flow. Another important point to consider is third parties. Third parties are an integral part of that user experience on your site, and therefore, they should not be ignored when it comes to measurement strategy either. So one way you can hold your third party accountable is to say that the server response time should be under a certain budget that you set for them. All in all, talking about budgets, you've been hearing this term of performance budgets throughout various sessions today. A performance budget is a framework that allows you to understand what changes represent progress and what changes uh, represent regressions. And it does take into account uh, the set of shared metrics, and you have budgets for each of those metrics, which are shown in this automated tool and made actionable. Let's actually take a look at how three different e-commerce companies took this idea of a performance budget and implemented it so well that they have seen some amazing results. Are you ready? OK, C-Discount is a French leader in e-commerce that had a problem that is not very really unlike many of us in e-commerce. They saw a big chunk of their traffic on mobile, but they didn't see that the mobile sales were at a similar ratio. They realized that this is not an easy problem to solve, right? So they broke organizational silos, and they empowered their marketing team to run deep analysis and come up with a set of shared best practices. They then implemented these best practices as budgets within their tool, and using the integration between um, Speed Curve and Slack, they ensured that when the budgets were not met, automatic alerts would be sent into the Slack channel, which were shared amongst all the cross-functional teams. By collaborating in making all of these different changes, they saw some really, really good results. Their mobile website conversion rate was 50% higher than their native app, which has a four, four and a half star in different app stores. This is something that all of us really can relate to, right? It's not easy to get there. Let's take another example. Carousel, which is a Singapore-based online uh, uh, marketplace used this idea of a performance budget because they really wanted their users in Southeast Asian countries where the predominant speed, network speed, is 3G. They wanted all of those, those users to have a great experience on their site. And so they started off with this kind of performance budget. Note that the first line here is about the critical rendering path resources bundle to be, un to be under 120 KB. This is irrespective of whether that bundle includes first party or third party, because they had this commitment that that bundle needs to be really small. They were so intent upon following this performance budget that they included this as part of their continuous integration process, such that the code could not be merged until this bundle or this budget was met. In order to do that, it was not an easy thing at all. So they really had to collaborate very, very closely with their design and marketing and analytics teams. And that really paid off very well, as you can see in this next slide. Not only are these metrics really good, but there's something here for every team that was part of this project. The product team cares about the page load time, the marketing team cared about organic traffic. The ads team cared about the click-through rates. And the transactions team cared about how many buyers and sellers were able to chat with each other to complete that transaction. So these were great results all in all. Let's look at a third example. As you heard earlier today about Wayfair, the home goods company here in US, that really wanted to improve user experience and make sure that they sustain that improvement. When they first started off with the performance budget, which they said was one of the most crucial parts of the measurement that they did, it did not take off that much, because these budgets were understood, but it was not very clear for everybody. While they made uh, so many changes towards optimizing their M site, they said that one of the most important things they did was to socialize their budget. 
And the way they did that was to make it clear using performance indicators, as you see here in colors. So this is how it worked. They had a budget, and they had an acceptable variance of plus or minus 10%. So if you're within that range, you're an orange. If you exceed that budget by more than 10%, then you enter the red area. And if you're better than the budget by more than 10%, then you've hit your goal. Congratulations, you're a green. They also had a competitor line, just to make things fun. This is how it looked for all internal users when they looked at their specific pages, since the budgets were set at a page type level for every route in the site. So the moment you look at your mobile site within the company, you were able to see these indi indicators that told you whether you're in the red, green, or orange. As you can see here, the way they set these budgets was the moment you hit the goal reliably, your budget and therefore goal, which is always 10% better than the budget, um, tightened up a little bit. You can see that over here, where once you hit the goal, the bar was raised, so to speak, and it actually tightened up over there. By the way, isn't this the kind of graph we all want to see, going from 2.3 seconds to 0.9 seconds? That's really awesome. This is their performance portal. Um, as you can see in this portal, they had a clear set of shared metrics, not just the metrics, but also the page level indicator. And they have a call to action at the bottom for users to uh, basically reach out to a Slack channel if they had questions about these metrics. Whether you're trying to use a performance budget idea or trying to use the general idea of a shared metrics, automated tool, and actionable next steps. Thinking about your measurement strategy at the beginning of your project is crucial to the success of the project. Another thing to remember about performance budgets is that it needs governance to think about the metrics at a page or route level, and also to maintain those budgets and metrics as moving targets as you go forward. It also needs to be enforced in a way that everybody can come together to meet or beat those budgets. And that makes it very, very su successful. We would love to go deeper into some of these partner stories, but true to form, we might be slightly above our performance budget for time. <laughs> so hopefully you learned something from today's talk. I think we want to focus on making sure your tools actually improve the user journey. And along the way, you might run into these three problems, org alignment, technical approach, measurement. This isn't anything new to us, and we hope some of these partner examples help you move a little further along on that journey. Which means you need to do something differently the next time you work on a performance project to build consensus and visibility for your project, to cross those technical hurdles to reach the North Star goal, and also not just to prove the impact, but also to sustain the improvement that you've worked so hard for. When you have all of these considerations for your project, I'm sure that working on performance projects can be very exciting and rewarding, as many of these partners would attest to. I'd like to say a special thanks for all of these partners that allowed us to share their stories with you today, and many others who've influenced this talk in some way or another. We would love to hear more from you and your specific challenges when you're trying to adopt modern web technologies. Please come find us at the Ask Room section during the break. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.